Alright folk, how you doing? Scotty. So I've done responses on second thought, having debunked these arguments today with the minimum wage, mere arguments today with capitalism, as well of course the argument he made on the monopolies, etc. Now I'm going to get done to his argument today with the state. After the recent social media crackdown on various far-right figures and groups, we saw conservatives calling for more state control of tech giants. You've got to love his lefty thought speak, where everything to the right of communism is basically far-right. Far-right this and far-right right that, everything's far right and it's all parodied for the mainstream media. Across Europe, the far right is on the rise. So if you support freedom of speech and you support the value of liberty, you're far right. Identity politics is this game of playing, let's label everybody that disagrees with us as a Nazi and a fascist, that way we can ridicule you, play the game of basically political correctness and then frighten you to try and silence you. Now the argument on the conservatives is just a black and white issue because no two conservatives are obviously the same. You've got conservatives who believe just leave it be, don't even touch them, don't get government involved. And then you've got these other conservatives who do believe in such a thing. There's many folk who have got good intentions in that. They don't realise the consequences of their actions. Hey, don't get me wrong, there is a problem today, there's no denying that. The issue you've got is these oligopolies and whatever. How do you end up in this mess? Well, it's through all the government's intervention to begin. We? The solution to the problem is actually to get government out of the economy, and the internet used to be something mere free market. And liberals defending these companies' rights as private entities. Well, these so-called liberals are partly right in what they say. At the end of the day, they are private entities, but it's no true private ownership. What you've got is a private sector that's all regulated by the state. You've got a style of economy that's corporatist, it's no capitalist, and as a result of government's interference, it was the same with the internet. You know, all so many years the government got involved in so many issues, you saw more and more centralisation in the internet, you saw that through the social media companies and whatever. There's nothing stopping you going elsewhere. You could you easily use any other search engine that you want, and you could easily pull away from Gmail and go and look for another email service, there's nothing stopping you from doing so. So it's not exactly this monopoly as people like to have you believe, and there's been a lot of bother that the likes of Andrew Torbers had to go through in order to get his business gone, especially with Gab, but it's down to the consumer's choice. But of course, you do live in this corporate system, so it's only natural. You're going to see these lobbyists try and beat out their competition and wipe them out, but that's not enough debut capitalism in the free market. This came as a bit of a shock to people from both camps, and less of a shock to people who realise just how similar the two groups are. Well, we've already established the fact that you try to oversimplify the Conservatives if you're speaking about the certain so-called Conservatives who support getting the government involved. I don't think they realise the trouble that, that would cause, and I certainly wouldn't trust a central government being the regulator, because then who regulates the regulator? You can easily go elsewhere, and if you want to use the example of Parliament, or getting shut down. Well, they should have taken precautionary measures. They shouldn't have become so dependent on that of companies like Amazon to begin with. You know, if you look at Library, which holds Odyssey and stuff, sites much like that of Gab, they own their own servers, so they're able to build their own site, their own browser and whatever, and that's the right way forward. But you can't get government involved, and especially you wouldn't trust it on, you know, your freedom of speech. So why the hell would you trust it on anything else? How does government define what you know, hate speech as etc. For example, it's easy enough to throw around words like you're a racist or you're a fascist or you're this, that and the next thing. Folk can end up finding themselves in jail, uh, despite the fact that it's something that's not even racist. For example, you know, you call for control of immigration. You know, lefties throw around the world, oh, you're a racist. It's all about decentralisation. That's the way forward. While we may want to appreciate the irony of this turn of events, it does bring up the question of what the government's role is in society. He actually doesn't understand the fact that government is the actual cause for why we're living under this oligopolistic, monopolistic system today. To be fair to the likes of Google, however, deserve to be in the position that they're in in many regards because of their success. However, if they abuse their power, then it's people's right that if they want to leave it, and there's nothing stopping you if you're doing so. Should the state be responsible for shutting down accounts seen as dangerous? And again, you're talking about the dangerous websites. Who gets to define what's dangerous? See, that's the issue. It's no different today with the freedom of speech. The government is the one that gets to define what that is. We already seen, of course, the whole issue on, you know, the Donald Trump issue and what happened at Capitol Hill. Now, it actually came out the evidence showing that was a setup. 
and they try to make Trump out as if he was the instigator. This is exactly the games that the left play it. And then they try to make you look like you're just here the bad gene. Does that mean to say that a freedom of speech website is the cause of the problem? I've seen many things being organised through sites like Facebook, etc. But you don't see them getting shut down, do you? Socialists don't like the idea that somebody's get the ability to think for themselves. Traditionally, the conservative worldview sees the state as a meddling entity against which they must protect themselves, and generally considers federal taxes or any form of regulation to be government overreach. That's not to say all conservatives. Of course, true conservatives do believe in that sort of thing because they believe in the free market and the right for believing in that, but you've just contradicted yourself. Contrarily, liberals usually see the state as the only entity capable of standing up to corporate greed, protecting the citizen, and providing for the people. You've got to laugh at that one. It was through all their government intervention that led to the rise of the corporatist system. That's the very reason why you saw the antitrust law legislation. That didn't break up supposed monopolies. It was something to give those with special interests leverage or the market to beat out their competition. So in other words, all your government legislation did was lead to the rise of all these cartels, oligopolies and monopolies and then you act like they're the saviour. To an extent, both views have some merit, while at the same time both being clearly oversimplified. I fail to see how the opposite side has any merit at all. They've no got any credibility, history's no on their side, and despite the fact that government's created a problem, you want to sit here and argue that somehow these lefties have some sort of rational, credible argument for their case. The fact that we're seeing the arguments of one camp now being upheld by the other clearly shows that neither view is entirely right or entirely honest. And what really matters to both sides is whatever best serves their interest. And that's precisely what the role of an effective state should be, to best serve its people. This theoretical garbage that government will somehow serve you after you gave it the power to tax you. You then question why the government is self-serving and filling its own pockets. That's the very reason why individual liberty is so important. It's why the free market is important. Because it's the only way that you can have a government that serves you. There's no such thing as this collectivism where government serves you. And your theoretical nonsense of this libertarian socialism, it doesn't exist. It's a case you have to actually get the government to get rid of the private sector to begin with. It's called nationalisation. Do you know what that does in practice? Well, ask yourself this question. When the government nationalises, who's the one that runs it? Is it the public? Well, who's the one that taxes you? So what you're saying is, is the government's just going to get rid of the private sector, but how's it going to do that? It has to use coercion. It takes mere and mere power, and the government in practice becomes mere and mere powerful. It grows bigger and bigger. Now, it requires a specific type of character to take you there. Do you know what that type of character is? It's not going to be your Jeremy Corbyn's or your Bernie Sanders. It's going to be a dictator. Why does it require a dictator because you're going to be forced to run the printing press and that's going to drive inflation through the roof and it's going to hurt a lot of people and a lot of poor people are going to be left in a desperate situation and riots will break out. It has to use mere and mere force. That's why it becomes dictatorial. Government and democracy were, in theory, designed to serve society. The only way government's going to do that is when government is left in a position where government's dependent upon you. That requires a free market economy. When you speak about theory and practice, when it comes to your socialism, your political leftism, you have to force your will upon everybody else. Because socialism isn't about individual liberty. It's not about individual rights. So in order for you to do that in the first place, you require control. And who's going to maintain that control? A central governing body. The very one that's going to go down the road of all this nationalisation with the dictatorship. There's no such thing as this democratic or libertarian socialism. The whole idea behind democracy is to allow for each and every person to have a say in how the country is run. Well, there's no problem in your argument. You're using the word idea, but they're collectively voting, and they're collectively in voting to infringe upon individual rights and liberty. People that you've never met before in your life collectively voting to force their will upon you through the use of a state. The state becomes the central and main element of the economy. That's the very reason why the United States the America formed a constitutional republic because they understood that democracy doesn't work. That's the very reason why Britain today no longer has the right to bear arms to protect themselves because the individual does not matter. The individual doesn't have a say. The individual is basically their rights are taken away from them because of what a collective group they've never met before says so. And this is the key point. 
politicians are supposedly elected to uphold those desires and defend the interest of their electorate. Again, you use this word desire, but you don't understand economic reality. You think it's just a case of all your desires, how you feel. Oh, I feel we should have the higher minimum wage. I desire it. Economic reality just says to you, who cares what you feel? And economic reality says, through the laws of supply and demand, when the price of something good drives up, the demand falls, all in the name of paying for your $15 minimum wage. Funny thing was, there was a lassie who in New York says, oh I finally got my $15 minimum wage, however I am now in a position where I can't make up for it because I'm not working enough hours. In other words, they cut back their working hours in order to pay for it, in order to compensate for it. You do not understand consequences for your actions. You think it's just a case of, well I desire this, who cares? You may intend for something to be a certain given way. Just because you've got the intention for something to be a certain given way, does that mean it say it turns out that way in practice? It's just like how you intend to have a libertarian socialism. You're going to have to take away my liberty and rights to, in order to get, reach that point. So in order to reach that point, you're going to need a central governing body to take you there. And how's the state just going to wither away? Do you want to answer that one? Or are you no going to? Your aspirations are all well said and done, but is the state just going to wither away after it takes all everything? So that's the difference between theory and practice. In the real world, you saw what happened with the Soviet Union and everything else. The entire debate of whether the state is an enemy of the people or its friend can be centered around the difference between its theoretical role and its behavior and practice. <laughs> So you actually do acknowledge the fact there's a difference between theory and practice then. So what happens then in the theory of this whole thing with the role of the state then? What happens in practice? In practice is your public ownership is in the hands of the state. That's the one that pays for everything. And that's essentially what you want to create, a dependent class upon the state. And then you wonder why the state does not serve you. And the laughable part is you think the problem is just a case of, oh, we just don't have the right type of politicians. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of this. <laughs> <laughs> that really is you socialist on one. <laughs> You don't get it, do you? The government is never going to serve you in a million years for as long as you put things into its, you know, horns. These people do not serve the interest of the citizen, but that of their wealthy friends and those who keep them in power. And people like yourself enabled that, that believed in this idea, we need government regulation to control the private sector to keep it in check. Well, there you go. That's what you get with Keynesianism. I suppose a fancy name for Keynesianism is social democracy, which is really just another way of saying I'm a corporatist. <laughs> there is just one thing everyone, regardless of political opinion, can agree upon, it's that politicians lie. And they lie a lot. Depending on whether or not their lie is convenient to you, you may find it justifiable. But the fact that we accept so much lying in our politics as the way things are shows just how badly the system has failed the average citizen. Of course politicians lie, but it comes down to this thing again. These politicians will make all the promises of pie in the sky to you because it's the only way that they're ever going to win your vote. You're never going to accept the truth. I mean, it's a bit like here in Great Britain. I mean, is a politician honestly going to come out and say to you, look, we can't afford social security and the NHS, we're just going to have to abolish it. That's the, the issue because because you don't understand the difference between economic reality and what these politicians promise you. It's a bit like, you know, during a pandemic where many businesses have gone under and are struggling as it is because of the inflationary problems as a result of running the printing press in order to bail businesses out, etc. So inflation spiralled out of control. And what do people like you call for? A higher minimum wage? You honestly think Biden was going to be stupid enough to actually give you that. Your country's more than $220 trillion in debt. He knows that that would drive unemployment through the, the roof and he knows he would get the blame for it because you don't understand the difference between theory and practice. The practice of your minimum wage results in the very problems with the soaring unemployment etc. As if enough people are not already unemployed. There are many fundamental issues in society that we should be focusing on. From access to healthcare, food and education, to ensuring a decent standard of living to everyone. I completely agree. There's things that we should be concentrating on, and that should be on things like healthcare, education, etc. This is where you basically take the gun, point it right at your foot, 
and pull the trigger because what you're about to say is about this today with the pharmaceutical companies. The role of the state, of our elected officials, is to tackle these issues. A state that serves the people is one that prioritizes their well-being with policies that aim to raise standards of living for all citizens. And you've got to look at when it comes to policies, not just the short term but the long term and analyse the given effects that policies have. The role of state is not basically to look after you in terms of the economy and more often than not, government's policy decision making has been detrimental. You only have to look at the minimum wage for example that's drove up unemployment and made people dependent upon the state. The American state today, whether helmed by a Republican or a Democrat, is little more than a corporate controlled duopoly whose number one purpose is to turn a profit. Oh, here we go again. It's basically this argument he's trying to say, well, it's for profits. He hasn't got a clue what profits are. Profits are signals, it's price information signals. It's telling the market what consumers need and want, so that's what profits are. It's not just a case of just something you fill your own pockets with. That isn't the cause of why government is self-serving. The difference is with the capitalist system, it provides for consumers' needs and wants. Government is not the same story. It holds a monopoly. Such a group of people will never implement policies that put citizen well-being above the dollar. Because you've put the government into that position, holding such monopoly power over you, and you're dependent upon the state for so many things, where it's monopolised the healthcare system, System, such as the social security etc where you're dependent upon the state. The modern American state functions as a giant bribery operation with no regard for human life, the exact opposite of its theoretical purpose. Again the very reason why they've got this problem is because of people like yourself who believe that you need to keep the private sector in check and therefore what you've got is a strongly government regulated private sector, you've got strong government intervention, the big nanny state and again it's because people are forced into a position of dependency upon the state for for so many things and you might not like to believe it but it's the truth of the matter especially when it comes to your healthcare system that's practically run by government. American politicians tend to scold and chastise developing countries when they display obvious corruption such as officials taking money from petrochemical companies in exchange for drilling rights. <laughs> This pretty much proves the point that you've not even got a clue what you're talking about. Because this is not a thought of David bribery. All this really is is basically a company that's been restricted because of heavy government regulation. All the red tape is stolen in the way. So what do you think businesses are going to do? They're obviously going to turn to government because they've got to seek the permission for government. It's the government that's the problem. The government's laid down the restrictions in the market and that hinders growth. That hinders productivity. That's the very reason why the cost of your private sector goods and services drive up. Because your government regulation restricts productive output. And the funny thing is, in previous videos, and even the one you're talking about monopolies etc, you said all oh, the unregulated markets. That is some unregulated market that is. And you get the audacity to complain about such issues like your cost of living etc. Climate change has been a known fact since the 80s. Oh I know this pish again folk. I've pointed this out before, see the whole thing today with the Roman Empire. It's been a time cycle, I mean back in the Roman period the average temperature much hotter back then than it ever has been today. Even the United Nations couldn't even point out their so-called evidence because they've no got any. It's temperature that drives CO2. It's no CO2 that drives temperature. If you basically think that, then you're disagreeing with the geologists themselves. <laughs> and I, I laugh at this, it's always the, the usual pish. You know, we've been listening to all these scare stories for more than a hundred years, and he starts talking about all this stuff today with the melting ice and whatever. Even the polar bear population back in like 1950 or something, it was like more than 5,000. And by about 2005, the, the polar bear population was sitting greater than 25,000 plus. See if you go back more than 500,000 years ago, the CO2 levels were much, much higher. More than twice as high as it is today. Do you know what the oyster population etc did then? All they did was they hardened their shells and adapted to the changes of the environment. Yet here's the usual scare story pish. The reason why they basically want to fill you into believing all this pish is just an excuse to say, here's why you need socialism. <laughs> yeah, funny that is. The most socialist countries on planet Earth today are the ones that are abusing the planet. They're the ones dumping plastic into the oceans. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't look after the environment, but I'll tell you something, it's no government that solves the problem. It's actually down to capitalism's innovation. Yet little to nothing has been done to tackle it, simply because the oil and gas lobbies sit at the table of every environmental meeting. Why? 
because they can pay their way there. Folks, see if you never had fossil fuels, you'd be screwed. I mean, even your green energy sector, you know, depends upon fossil fuels. Green energy and their attempt to turn, you know, motors towards the electric. All motors by 2030 will be running uh, electric motors. Oh, that great, fantastic. And how the hell are they going to power it? Never mind the electric motors, just everything else where you see, you know, your economy so heavily depends upon fossil fuels. They honestly I think it's just a case of snap the finger and it's just, you know, gone. We can just get rid of it and that's it. They would honestly take us right back to the dark ages. <laughs> the reason why they're obviously going to sit down at a table and discuss is because people's livelihoods is at risk. You know, people actually work in the oil industry. They've got jobs today. So, of course, they're going to sit down at a table. I mean, what are you expecting? For all those people to just, uh, uh, you know, end up unemployed? And what about all the other sectors of the economy? with fossil fuels, all those jobs that are going to be lost. So of course they're going to sit at the table. It's not a case that they sat at the table just to lobby. 